This interview is going to be fantastic because we have an amazing guest today, Professor Jim Mazurkiewicz, uh, Professor Emeritus of the Department of Agriculture, Leadership, Education and Communications at Texas A&M, man of so many interests, man of almost infinite knowledge, uh, a true Paul, a true American, a true Texan. <laughs> Professor, thank you so much for, for finding me. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. It is an honor, honestly. I don't know where to start because we could talk <laughs> for hours and we would not exhaust all the subject, but we have to start with, with you and your family. Okay. Because you can trace your, your roots yes. centuries back. I can trace my roots, uh, and, and I could go further, but I had to stop, you know, because I'm <laughs> involved in so many things. But I can go back 300 years in 16 different lines uh, of my entire family back to Poland. I'm 100% of Polish descent. Mm -hmm. I've done my DNA. It, sh it shows that as well, and I'm very, very proud of that. And uh, my family came here, Zahlebem. Yeah. Uh, with the the second big immigration group. The first one was the Panamaria group from mm -hmm. Schlont that came to Texas that established the first and oldest Polish settlement, so, the first Catholic settlement. church, Polish Catholic church in the United States is in Texas. And that was before the Civil War. After the Civil War, when the slaves were re uh, uh, released, there was a shortage of labor. And so there was a Polish Jew in the Brazos Valley, which is on the eastern side of the state, mm -hmm. where all the cotton plantations were. And those 12 major cotton plantation owners says, we need labor. And this Polish Jew was the major cotton buyer, businessman. And he says, I will go back to Poland because there's a problem in Poland right now in Prussia with Kultur camp. And there's people are disgruntled and oppressed. I think I can get them to move here to work. So he went back, brought back the first 150 as indentured servants to pick the cotton in the Brazos Valley. That is the biggest alluvial soils uh, in that part of the area where all the mm -hmm. cotton plantations were. And that's how my ancestors came to Texas. That was after the Civil War. So you had two major groups, Zalebim in Texas. One was Schlont in South Texas, and then Wielka Polska uh, to uh, the Brazos Valley after the Civil War. And then later people came from Galatia. Today we've got them coming from all over Poland, all over the United States. And uh, we're very proud of our Polonia in Texas. So you're what? Third, fourth generation Polish American? I am fifth generation. Fifth generation. I am fifth. Pionti Pokolinia, yes, them. And my pra pra jatkovi, jedenaste pra pra jatkovi, pshahali de Texasche, zahlebe. It amazing. It is amazing because you sound, you look, you have a knowledge of first or second generation of Polish American. <laughs> and you tell me it's five generations. Yeah. Uh, your love for Polish culture. Uh, for Polish heritage must be through the roof. Uh, tell me about well, let the, me tell you the, the organizations Polish. that you're involved with. Okay, well, let me first tell you how Polish I am. Yeah. 48 years ago, my first job was here in Chicago. I could have gone anywhere and taken the first job for the USDA meat grading because mm -hmm. I was an agriculturalist. But I chose Chicago because it was the number one Polish community in the United States. And I wanted to learn more about my history, my culture, my heritage. And I came here to so Chicago. That, actually drove you here. That, that was 21 years old. That's a long time ago. And I've been, I've always known I was Polish. I did not know I wasn't Polish. I was raised that way. My parents' first language was Polish. My grandparents, great grandparents, I knew these people could not speak any English. You must your movies for Polsku, because, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, because that was demanded. We, that, exactly, exactly. And so uh, I'm the first generation to go past the seventh grade on both sides of my family. And uh, I'm the first, my language, my first language, I'm the first generation speaking English is the first language. So you can speak only in Polish, and you can do it when I'm in Poland, I can make it when I'm in Poland, that but I'm not amazing. 100%. That is amazing. So how, how does Polonia look right now in Texas? We're very proud of our Polonia. We've got over 50 organizations throughout the state. We're a big state, you know, because all the way to El Paso, mm -hmm. actually El Paso is closer to the California state line than it is to Houston. <laughs> So you can imagine. Uh, so we have a Polonia in El Paso. We've got Polonia in Dallas, Fort Worth. We've got Polonia in Austin, San Antonio. Of course, Pano Maria, the Brazos Valley, Chapel Hill, Bremont. But Houston right now is the capital, uh, is the Stolica, Polonia in, in Texas right now because the biggest number of them are there. But they are still active in all these other cities and put she in the rural areas yeah. as well. Um, 
we see a huge influx of, of young professionals, young Polish uh, engineers and entrepreneurs. entrepreneurs who are coming to United States, but yes. they're skipping New York, they're skipping America, they go right there to Texas, to California. Do you see those people, those young emerging Of course Poles? we see those people because I'm there to welcome them when they get there. Mm -hmm. And I uh, certainly, as president of Texas Polonia, we are welcoming these bright, educated, smart young people that are innovative. And uh, let me just say this, Austin is the new Silicon Valley or the second Silicon Valley growing very rapidly. The, the film industry, Google, Microsoft mm -hmm. has also opened businesses there as well. Houston is the medical capital of the world, the energy capital of the world. It's also home of NASA. Yeah. Dallas has become the financial center of the Southern United States. So within the golden triangle of Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Austin, and Houston, I live in College Station right in the middle. So I'm two, three hours in any to one reach. direction of 70% of, uh, of, of the state's population. Today, we have 31 million people in Texas. We're growing by 1,000 to 1,200 people every day. That's not the immigrants coming across the Rio Grande. These are people coming from, El from uh, California, from mm -hmm. Chicago, New York, New Jersey, coming to Texas because of the dynamic economy, the diversified economy that we have in Texas. The incentives that the government And the incentives is. and the, and the low cost of living, the low taxes, the low cost of housing, the opportunity to buy land and to grow. We still have lots of room in Texas to settle. Yeah, this is going to be the future of the United States. It's, it's, it's shifting west. It's, it's right it's, there in Texas. The economy is on fire. Mm -hmm. Last year, we had a $25 billion surplus in the in the in this texas government the year before two years ago we had 38 billion dollar surplus where other states are having a negative effect we know it firsthand and, and so we have we're giving money back mm -hmm. uh to the to the taxpayers and also also inventing investing in our infrastructure and investing in the future we have a rainy day fund of several billions of dollars if the economy goes in the tank like it did in 2008 texas will be fine we were fine in 2008 as well and we're thinking and in in investing and looking to the future. Awesome. Professor, your contributions to Poland are not just about preserving the heritage and yeah, nourishing exactly. that in Texas. Yeah. Uh, you are working with Polish government, with Polish officials, yes, yes. and you would never guess it, uh, to help protect Poland uh, in terms of energy supply yes, yes. and make Poland independent from Russian uh, oil and specifically gas. Exactly. Let's talk about that. Well, let me just say this. When I, my first trip to Poland was 2002. I didn't go back to 2010 with another group of agribusiness people. And I learned on this trip. And then in 2011 that they were starting to talk about building this port in Szynowice. Szynowice, yeah. And then I started going back from 2011 every year. And I learned more and more about it. And I got connected to some key people in the Polish government. Uh, and, and that became friends with them. I learned more about it. Texas was becoming energy independent at that time. And we had an import for LNG, but we didn't have an export. Mm -hmm. That happened with Chenier Energy. And so I saw an opportunity. So I connected the governor's office of Texas with the minister of energy. And it, and it took about four years prior to this. But in June of 2017, the first shipment of LNG from Texas came to Shunawushja. And today, uh, there's about, I think last year, there were 49 different ships that came from Corpus Christi, Texas, from Chenier. And they continue to dominate the market. In April 22, uh, 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 2022, Poland became independent, independent of Russian gas. And I am so proud of that. But I am proud of the Polish government because this was their thinking was already trying to become energy independent because that's for national security. They were thinking about this already 10, 12 years ago. And way so way before the war, way before the war. And all of this kind of thing. And they were telling us already, you know, they were getting nervous when the winds would blow from the east. They were telling us that they didn't trust uh, the Russia and in uh, and, and this particular situation. So they were already doing that. Kudos to the Polish government over the years for doing this. And thank you for the role that you participated, because I would never guess uh, that the gas so, is brought from, from other countries, from the other side of Atlanta. It's coming from Texas. And uh, let me say That's this, awesome. that they said, so how did a Polish cowboy and an agriculture professor <laughs> get involved in LNG gas? Yeah. You know, I tell my students this, you don't have to know everything. You just need to know who does. Mm -hmm. The governor at that time had the same education in agriculture as me. He was the agriculture commissioner of Texas, became lieutenant governor and then governor. 
And I, and I befriended his deputy chief of staff and I took his deputy chief of staff to Poland six times on my nickel so that we could show this. And then he went with a group of 15 billionaires from his economic development council wow. to understand what was happening in this Poland as a economic powerhouse. It is growing to become today and it is already a very dynamic. Wow. Those contributions were recognized by Polish officials. You received a Cavalier's Cross yes. of the Order of Merit of Poland. Yeah. I think you deserve <laughs> way more, and, and I hope that, that more <laughs> awards will be coming. You're also a doctor honoris causa of yeah. uh, SGGW, Szkoła Główna Gospodarstwa Wiejskiego yeah. uh, in Warsaw. So I think Poland knows, uh, and, well, and Poland you. is ex extremely grateful, as we know. Well, thank you. I, I didn't do it for that. I'm doing it because, you know, you know, a true leader is one that can give. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, God, I feel, put me here for a purpose. And I'm here to represent my family, my people. Uh, Poland is the greatest geopolitical ally today in Europe, but they have always been aligned with the United States. And I am so proud of that. And they are very grateful to the United States for many, many things. And, uh, and, and we're, we're leaders. We've been allies since since Kuczusko and Pulaski. Exactly. But then Very there's beginning. some history in Texas too that Polish gets credit for us winning our independence from Mexico. And we can talk about that as well, but not many people know about let's, that. Let's talk about it because this is an awesome story. Because we mentioned Kościuszka and, and, and Pulaski. Of course, of course. But it doesn't stop there. No, okay. In 1830 and 31, they call it the Cadet Revolution or the November Uprising in mm -hmm. Warsaw against Russia, even back then against Russia. OK, there were 50,000 cadets. We lost or the Polish lost that. But there were several people that were leaders of that, that were refugees that had to escape from the czar's uh, yeah. sword. Yeah. 235 of them went to Galicia because the Habsburg group were a little bit more friendly to them. But the czar found out about it. So only Uchikali de Naviarku. They ran away to New York. Mm -hmm. Sam Houston, our general at the time, recruited 43 of these men to come to Texas to help us train and become officers in the Texas militia. Why were they important? All 43 of them had academy, military academy training in Warsaw, and especially in Napoleonic war tra uh, warfares. Mm. How we did we win the San Jacinto? It was the element of surprise. That's 100% Napoleonic war tactics. Wow. The battle lasted 18 and a half minutes. And uh, anyway, I can give you the so names that, that, and some of those things. That's Polish contribution actually to Texas. And, and I've got information, and we're still working on this, that Andre Felix Varzinski and his patrol on the day after the battle at San Jacinto captured Santa Ana, didn't know he had him, brought him into the camp, and the uh, other Mexican uh, military were saluting this guy because he was in peasant clothing, mm -hmm. not in his military uniform, but they still recognized him. They presented him to Santa Ana, and hence now we have, the, then became the Republic of Texas, and then the state of Texas. Texas is the only sovereign nation to ever join the United States. We were a country for nine and a half years. That's why we can drill oil on offshore 18 miles off and all those platforms out there, that money goes to Texas coffers. Every other state in the United States and it can only go three miles off because we were a sovereign nation. Our international waters goes a little bit further. This is amazing. You have what, 33 hours? Of I have 33 hours of history. lecture of Polish Texas history. I've been teaching it for St. Thomas the last two years. I'm not going to teach it this fall, but I will do it again next year. Mm -hmm. I'm involved in many, many organizations. I serve on eight to dip, eight to ten different boards in Texas uh, and the community. I'm serving on two or three now in Warsaw, uh, trying to uh, to share my knowledge, my contact. And the other thing is we've got to invest in our youth. Because then there's that, no us in the future. That is the future, exactly. <laughs> uh, but professor, uh, but your area of expertise is agriculture. Yes. How did you, did you choose that particular field? I didn't know any better. <laughs> yeah, you were <laughs> born and raised I'm a fifth a generation farm. Farmer. Texas farmer. <laughs> and so all I knew was agriculture. I didn't know. I was very good in math, actually. I could have been an engineer. I didn't know that. But my family were farmers and ranchers. Mm -hmm. We grew up picking cotton. I picked cotton until I was 13 by hand. OK, uh, we were very poor. You know, the movie, The Coal Miner's Daughter about Loretta Lynn. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have she didn't have anything on me growing up. And so we were we learned to work with our hands. We learned to think on our feet. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud of my background and my heritage. But uh, but yes, I, uh, I I was working for one of the most prominent agriculture families part time. Mm 
-hmm. and I'd ride my horse or my bicycle to work. Okay. And we would work cattle or we would do on tractors or whatever. And I asked the owner, I says, where's the best agriculture university in Texas? He said, just up the road, Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. I says, where is that? Because my family was not educated. I had no idea. I'm the first generation to go to college and study Polonia in the Brazos Valley. And so I, I, he said, Texas A&M. So I said, where is it? Well, I went, it was only 63 miles from my house. It could have been 600 <laughs> far as I knew. So I went, entered myself, paid myself through, put myself through working summers and jobs and things like that. I majored in agriculture and I was very good. Uh, uh, participated in livestock and meat judging teams. And a result of that, I was recruited and hired by USDA and I was given the first job here so in, in Chicago. Chicago. How did it happen that you came back? Because usually Chicago keeps those people who move in. <laughs> well, I was engaged to the wife I'm married to today. We've been married 46 years. We were engaged and I wanted to move back to Texas. That was her doing. I was homesick for my family. Yeah. And just like people in Poland today go back to see the Jatki, you know, in Poland and that. You know, family is everything, and that's yes. pure Polish, you know, faith, yes. family, and friends. Exactly. That's 100% true. Um, what did you do specifically at the Texas A&M? What was your work focus on? Uh, the academic work. Okay, my academic work. My, my research was on embryo transfer in beef cattle, mm -hmm. and I'm doing that today for myself. You know, I'm a scientist by training and leadership by experience. Yes. And so... Uh, but that was my, tr my, uh, my dissertation was on embryo transfer, comparing uh, Bos indicus cattle to Bos taurus, which are two different subspecies, mm -hmm. and the difference in the maturity differences at eight-day embryos. And that's a long time ago. The research has been, is much more advanced than that So it's a cutting-edge research. It's not like telling people how to plant, where to plant, how to you know, collect the no, crops. No. no, it's totally different. It's cutting-edge science. It was cutting-edge science at the time. But they, have, they know much more than I did back then to this day. <laughs> but, but, I, uh, but I'm so proud of the job that I have today is I run the largest agriculture leadership enhancement program yes. in the state. And these are for industry leaders. The average age is 37. In this current class, I have the chairman of the Texas House of Representatives, chairman of the Agriculture Committee. He's one of my school scholars, one of my students. So this is like a second level, a third level. Yeah, it's like an MBA in agriculture policy and issues and challenges facing agriculture. Feeding the world is a national and international security issue. Yes. And everyone wants safe food. Everybody wants inexpensive food, mm -hmm. high quality food, and a, and a variety. Because today, when I grew up, we only got sweet corn in July, watermelons at the 4th of July. Yeah. Today, you can buy watermelons year round, yeah. strawberries year round. We're growing them around the world. I helped HEB, the largest number, voted the number one grocer in the United States in Texas. They have 60% of the market share. They're bigger than Walmart and Kroger put together in Texas, <laughs> family owned business. I took them to Poland in 2017 for the first time. They're buying lots of Polish products, bringing them into Texas. And I can show you the, the labels. If you read the back of the box, it will say made, made in Poland. Poland. Exactly. And uh, so I'm very proud of that as well. And in Texas, HEB is just like a, uh, uh, is, it's like a, another family. Everybody loves that grocery store in Texas, I can assure you. Wow. I don't know what to say. Honestly, you, you contribute so much in in. in in such a real way, it's not just talking about it, it's bringing real effects, real results into that American US connections. Uh, so, why not? I don't know any better. You know? <laughs> it, my father no, always taught me this. My father didn't have an education like me, but there's one thing he taught me there's no such thing as cannot do it. Find a way. Find a way. Uh, let's talk about the agriculture and let's try comparing agriculture here in America to what we have in Poland. Okay. What are the strong and weak sides of both sides of that equation? Okay. Well, let me say this. Uh, the United States, in my opinion, has a couple of issues coming to us. Mm -hmm. One, only 1% 1 of the population today is in farming and ranching, and the average age is 61. Really? That old? Yes. And so the farms here, its economy is the scale. There's not any subsidies to speak of. And so by economy scale, they've got to get bigger to produce more mm -hmm. to, you know, to spread their cost. But the, the, the average age of the farmer is growing. Who is going to do this? Mm -hmm. High risk, low return, mm -hmm. big investment. And, it's a, and, and it, it's and, hard and, work. And well, not only that, you're uh, at the mercy of the weather. Mm -hmm. In Poland, I see lots of young people, smart people. Uh, I see newer tractors, newer combines. 
very efficient, high quality food. But what is important, I see a lot of young people wanting to come back and farm. And I see them at the Polish uh, Ag Field Days and things like this. We'll see as many young people as we see people my age there. Wow. And I'm very proud of that. That's awesome. And, and let me say this. These young people today in Poland are very high tech and very savvy. And they've got GPS in their tractors, computers in their tractors. Th those young people, I'm very proud of that. What they're learning from Texas is what they want to see is because we have a water shortage. What's going to, what's going to hold Texas back, but we'll have to figure out, is enough water for these 31 million people and mm -hmm. also for growing agriculture. But we use irrigation and we're very efficient. We use a lot of the, from the Middle East, from Israel, a lot of that, uh, like Netafim and some of these companies like this of drip irrigation is very, very efficient. And they're wanting to study that because there's some pockets in Poland that could use some irrigation. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know in the fruit industry over there they do, but there's places like Kujawy Pomorski that are growing a lot of uh, row crops that could use some, some irrigation. So there's one thing. One thing that we did promote uh, several years ago was no-till farming. Uh, to, you know, to reduce the trips over the farm, uh, over the over the fields. Uh -huh. And uh, and so uh, uh, today, uh, 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 Shimanchek from uh, Nikukureza brought that back and implemented it through his field day. And he's been running that for 30 years. And he's a dear friend. So that's that's going to lower the cost. That's going to improve the quality. Exactly. So exactly. many benefits. Yes. And reduce uh, the CO2 emissions, et cetera, mm -hmm. dust, et cetera. Yes. Wow. To me, one of the biggest differences is, is the subsidies that Polish uh, um, farmers are getting from the European Union and from mm -hmm. the Polish government mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. in the States. Those are almost or literally non-existent. Exactly. And that's why they've got to farm more mm -hmm. and to, to cover their costs as expenses go up. We're being paid the same price as we were 20 years ago, basically, yeah. at the farm gate. And so we have to produce more and more efficiently here. Um, and, and let me say this, the, the policy, the farm bill, the farm policy in Europe is a little bit different. They want to protect the small farms here by our system. It's encouraging the farms to get bigger. I think there's going to have to be something come to the middle and both as we move forward. Uh, I, I admire what they're doing in Europe, not just Poland, but the EU yeah. and trying to protect these smaller entrepreneurs and things like that. But it's maybe not as efficient. What's going to happen when uh, the uh, the public, like they did in the United States, decided they didn't want to spend that money on that and they took the subsidies away and it forced us to get bigger in economies of scale. Uh, but 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 the product in, in Europe, the product here are equal mm -hmm. uh, and they both are efficient. They both do a good job. Right. And, uh, you know, the farmer's love of the land is second to none. Oh, yeah, that's true. That, that's one of And both. We have that in common. Yeah. A uh, hot topic of conversation right now is also on immigration. And those yes. who are f for immigration say that without cheap labor coming from across the border, it's going to be impossible to maintain the low cost of uh, some agricultural products. That's uh, true. Is that true? It's true. Mm -hmm. But what we need to do is document and verify yeah. who's coming. You're not a country without a secure border. Yeah. We have millions of undocumented people over here. Your family, my family came over here and went through the process. They were vetted. We welcome immigrants. We are a country of immigrants. Without immigrants, there wouldn't be a United States. Mm -hmm. We welcome them. We it's have to have them in construction and agriculture mm -hmm. in many, many areas. But they need to be vetted. Without that, we you look, it took what three people to do nine one one? We've yeah. got thousands of people that are undocumented that I'm have come, they've been released in Central and South America. They didn't want to pay anymore. That most of those people were in prison and things like that. One terrorist is too many. True. You know, a, a life is priceless. And in my opinion, I, I welcome immigrants. I'm a product of immigrants. I welcome them to this day. Everyone is welcome to my home. My door is open to everyone. But let's document and vet these people coming through because not everybody likes America. Unfortunately, true. But uh, yeah, uh, is it really uh, one of the factors that, that keeps uh, the prices uh, of some products as, as low as they are right now? Uh, in which areas the, 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 those immigrants, this cheap labor is, is right, used to most? Right, right, Well, you know, if you'll go back and look in history of the United States, my family came over as cheap labor. They came over, the original yeah, settlers we were yeah. indentured servants. They were How working is it for today? free. And, uh, and so today, yeah, we need to have low cost of labor. Those folks that are coming in without an education, without skilled workforce and things like that. They're starting their American That's dream. That's right. And they're starting their American dream for their kids mm -hmm. because these are smart people, hardworking, good people coming as well. And like I said, we need them. I'm not against that. 
My deal is, is that we need to vet and document them. And that is keeping it down. Let me just say this. Prices have gone up about 30% since COVID. And because uh, it's difficult to get people to do that kind of work. No one wants to go out there. Everybody wants an eight to five job five days a week or maybe work from home two days a week. Yeah. You can't pick strawberries from home. You can't pick apples from home either. Somebody has to pick mm -hmm. it. We don't have machines to do everything. But we are working on that, but we're not there yet. So are we going to do that convenience and for price versus taste? Uh, you are, and this is extremely uh, interesting, uh, a judge in a livestock competition. <laughs> uh, that's something very unique to America, very American. I mean, uh, there are events like this in Poland. Sure it is. Uh, sure. But here in America, it's... It's an industry, I can say. Well, I'm a state, national, and international approved beef mm -hmm. cattle judge. Krowe za mieso. Yeah. Niemlich, ne? I like krowe za mieso. Meat cattle, mm -hmm. beef cattle, okay? And actually, uh, you know, I've judged probably 13, 14, 15 different state fairs all over, the, you know, through here, up in the north as well. I've judged every major show in Texas. We've got the biggest livestock shows ever. Mm -hmm. uh, Texas has about... Uh, Oh, I'd say about 12 million head of cattle. That's more than wow. most, uh, probably, uh, there's only eight states with a population bigger than 12 million in the United <laughs> States. So 51% of our cash receipts in Texas is beef cattle. But we're also the biggest cotton producer, but that's only 14% of mm -hmm. our cash receipts. But we are the biggest cotton producer as well. We have all kinds, we have vegetables, we have citrus, we have rice, we have sugar cane. We've got many, many things. We're a big cabbage producer, big spinach mm -hmm. producer as well in the South. And... Uh, but yes, I'm a beef cattle judge, and today I have registered Charlet cattle. The, the breed was originated in France, and I've got what is the top 1% of the genetics in the United States that I'm uh, raising and producing. My son and I, my son James and I are partners. Uh, when I'm gone, he's the one that, uh, he's the, you know, the worker <laughs> mm -hmm. taking care of their business. So those best specimens, they're bred like like a separately. You 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 breed them specifically so, for the show, or you just go through the herd and oh my goodness, this is an awesome specimen. So, so you are going. So to So I'm buying them online, and I'm buying embryos, frozen embryos, okay. out of the national champion bulls and national champion cows, mm -hmm. and the top genetics with statistics that back it up. You know, for uh, uh, you know, with enough muscle that are sound cattle that have some marbling for taste, mm -hmm. that milk that will make good mothers, etc. And, uh, and so, uh, and I'm looking at phenotype as well as genotype, and we're putting that together. So there's a lot of research I, before. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a science. It it's is. a science and a little bit of skill. <laughs> uh, how do you judge those uh, those, those Well, the those cattle species? that we're looking for, because these are, the Charlet cattle are terminal crosses. That means we put them on uh, cattle that are more maternal, that are more mother-like. These are more beef breeds. We're trying to produce beef bulls to cross them back on these other breeds of cattle like Angus, for mm -hmm. example, or others. And uh, we want cattle that are good on their feet and legs. That is their, uh, you know, like good tires on your car. You're not gonna go anywhere without good feet and legs. Okay, they need to have balance. Uh, they want to have small shoulders, but you want them to have enough muscle. We don't need anything bigger than maybe a 14, 15 inch ribeye. You mm -hmm. can get them too big. I've seen them in Belgium where they have these Belgian blues that are double muscle. Here in the Texas, you know, a lot of these cattle calve out on the plains, or out on the ranches uh, without assistance. And so we're breeding for calving ease, but then fast growth where they're gaining, you know, uh, very quickly where it's the least cost of production, uh, feed efficiency, these type of things like that. And, uh, you know, trying to put this, the females need to look like females, bulls need to look like bulls. Well, do a lot of people participate in, in, in those shows, in, in those competitions? Well, uh, in Houston, we'll probably have, during the Houston show, there, uh, there'll be a show just for kids. There'll be 2,000 uh, steers for them to show. My kids have won several of those champions over the years when they were showing. There'll probably be, I'm going to say, eight, 9,000 head of cattle shown in Houston. Uh, there'll probably be 15, 20,000 pigs, maybe 8,000 lambs, 8,000 goats, uh, you know, maybe a, you know, 800 to 1,000 pins of chickens and rollers and things like that. And that money is used for scholarships. Mm -hmm. There's not a program in the United States like we have in 4-H and FFA in Texas where we're giving money back and we find those projects. Just in my local county fair, I uh, put a get syndicate together and I've been buying the Grand Champion Steer just in my pub yacht, my mm -hmm. county. Yeah. I paid $38,500. The kids get all of that money towards wow. their college education. We raised a $1.4 million in just my county. They'll raise several millions at Houston. So we've got county shows. We've got regional shows. I'm president of the Brazos Valley Fair and Rodeo. I've been president for 13 years since we started it. 
I'm going to leave here Saturday morning and go back and open the rodeo for Saturday night. I'll have my black cowboy hat, my boots, and et cetera, my, and my, my other uniform, you know. And, uh, and we're very proud of that. We give away thousands of dollars in scholarship and prizes at this. But San Antonio has a rodeo. Austin has a rodeo. Dallas, Fort Worth, et cetera. San Angelo, Mercedes down in the valley, Waco, et cetera. That's amazing. And, so are you a football fan? I'm a football fan. My son is the, the, the statistical guru and my youngest daughter, <laughs> Stefania. Do you play uh, fantasy football with them? I like to watch it, you, you know, watch the game and that, but I've been waiting since 1973, since I was a freshman at Texas A&M, to win the national championship, and I'm still waiting. We've only won it one time, you and that close. was 1939 was the only time we ever won the national championship. But you were so damn close we with, were with very Johnny close. Football. I, with Johnny Football. What an amazing talent. Yes. What an amazing talent and a tragedy in itself. Uh, but, you know, he's come back. He's he's mentoring young people in trying to help people not commit so some of the same mistakes. He's still there mentoring, coming back and helping other young football players. But what a talent. The guy that uh, the stadium that Johnny Menzel built is Kyle Field. We remodeled that that field and it was a five hundred million dollar remodel, which yeah. is a half a billion. And it's the third largest stadium in the United States. It'll seat 108,000 people. But we had 110,000 this summer, the largest concert in the history of the world with George Strait, Cowboy Music. No way. Yes, sir, 110,000. Uh, my kids went. I didn't. I, I, was, uh, I was traveling or doing something uh, somewhere in the world. I don't know where I was. But anyway, but the kids went. But that was the largest um, pop uh, number of people in the stadium ever and bigger than any, any other artist in the United States. Wow, in the stadium. Let's paint a picture because I, we, we have to explain exactly what happened in 21. It was it uh, 13 and 14? Yes, sir. Texas, the Aggies were not known for their football Exactly, on the national stage. No. Exactly. But that catapulted Texas A&M to the but national one, prominence. One player did. One player. Johnny Manziel. Johnny Man Manziel, yes. And, and, and all of a sudden... Uh, the Aggies were, what, top 10 team in the top nation? Top yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then we joined the SEC, mm -hmm. remember? The toughest conference The toughest is. conference ever. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. Yes, it is. It certainly was humbling a little bit, but too. <laughs> the business aspect of it is fascinating. Oh, my God. Because all of a sudden, money started pouring, pouring in into the Texas A&M. And you were on the staff. You were in the faculty. You saw it with your own eyes. Yes, sir. How was it? It, it was amazing. It was amazing. And let me say this. When we remodeled the stadium, that half of that $500 million was all done with private funds. And there was money left on the table because there was nothing much left at the time to There's sponsor. There's they could buy. They, exactly. Build. But they have been clever and they're reinventing some opportunities and things like that. But the money came pouring in. Let me say this. The, the culture of Texas A&M is second to none. We were originally a military school. We're mm -hmm. full of culture and traditions, just like Polish people. Very conservative, but very full of tradition and our history. And uh, we, we, we like to consider ourselves like a good cult, okay? And I've got this ring right here. This ring is a, uh, a symbol mm -hmm. of Texas A&M. And when you see this ring anywhere in the world, you, you know. have an immediate friend. I was on the wall of China many years ago, and a man came up to me and says, Howdy, I'm so-and-so. Class of 57. I said, howdy, really? I'm Jim Mazurkiewicz, class oh, of 77. And we're proud of that. There is no other uh, university with the loyalty of the alumni back to a university other than Texas A&M. Please come sometime. I'll take you to a football game. You have to be there to feel it, to understand it. It's hard to explain to someone in a conversation yes. unless you've been there. And experience that. And it's a friendly campus. You'll find out that people will stop and help you. Uh, they'll say, yes, sir, no, sir, open doors for you. The Southern hospitality, I'm telling you that we're very proud. But that all goes back to our military roots. We opened it up to non-military in the 1960s, opened it up to women as well. It was 100% male military school originally. Wow. And uh, so 17, 1876 is when the doors opened. And uh, and so today we're the largest student body population in the United States. Eighty thousand students in the A&M system. We have over one hundred and eighty five thousand because there's uh, eleven universities in the system. Mm -hmm. A&M is the mothership. We have eight state agencies and a medical school, dental school, law school, etc., all within the system. And uh, and so it's mighty. 
Also, Texas A&M is the largest Catholic student body in the United States, it's larger than not Notre, Notre Dame. Dame. <laughs> We've produced two bishops in the last 10 years wow. from uh, our St. Mary's, uh, the church for the students. We just opened last year a new building that will soon be a basilica, a $34 million facility. And what I am so proud of, there are three Polish saints in there. Relics. In that yes, church. we have Maximilian Kolbe, mm -hmm. Sister Faustina, and Jan Pavel II. And let me guess, you took part in bringing. Those I cannot relics. take credit for that. I'm not going to take credit for that. But I, everyone thinks I did. But I, <laughs> but I'm sure enough promoter, big promoter of it. Okay. Yeah, but uh, everything is bigger in Texas. Well, no, we everything's bigger except our water. You know, you've got yeah. more water up here than we do. Of course, you got these beautiful Sometimes lakes up here, but. They are big, like our state capital. Our state capital is six meters taller than Washington, D.C. Because <laughs> Mushi Bits than There you, you go. <laughs> it has to be bigger, you know. So uh, you do not take credit for bringing those relics into the, the new basilica, no, no. but you should take a lot of credit into putting together the uh, Polish Center in Panama Maria, Texas. I'm on the board of directors, but mm -hmm. the, the leader of the Panama Maria Center was uh, Bishop. John Yanta, Bishop yeah. Yanta. And uh, John uh, Bishop Yanta saw something in me. I don't know what he saw, but he saw that. And he asked me to be on the board of directors to help promote the center, to, to help raise money, mm -hmm. uh, to help visibility, to bring people from Poland, to bring people from Texas, all over the United States, all over the world. It was his vision that we all admire and we look up to. Well, he could not do it alone, as the story goes. He had a lot of lieutenants. Yes. <laughs> you were one of the most important. Professor, thank you so much. We could go on and on and on, you know. Uh, your contributions are invaluable, honestly. Well, okay? thank and you. thank you so much. You're here in Chicago for the 60 Million Congress. Yes. You're one of the speakers. What will you be talking about? I am going to talk about this. Yes, this mi jedna Polona. Polonia. Jawat Razin. We have to work together. Stari Polonia and Novi Polonia. I'm going to talk about the bright future that Poland is today and the, and the yet to come. And what, you know, one of the fastest growing economies in Europe is Poland. The biggest geopolitical ally in Europe is Poland for the United States. Yes. I'm going to talk about the trade between the two. I'm going to talk about the highlights, the tech industry in mm -hmm. Poland. I'm going to just highlight little bitty things. I'm not going to go into detail. But I'm going to promote Poland to the United States and then United States to Poland. to Poland. Professor, thank you so much. Thank you for everything you did. I'm sure there's more to come. You're not done, I can tell. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just by a few minutes they, we spent they, together. They there says, Jim, no when are you going to retire? I says, I'm what? never going to retire. I'm going to go out like a bottle rocket. <laughs> 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 Professor, thank you so much. Pani uh, Panovia, ladies and gentlemen, Professor uh, Jim Mazurkiewicz, uh, Professor Emeritus of the Department of Agriculture, Leadership, uh, Education and Communications at Texas A&M. But there is so many titles and awards that you got that the introduction and the thank yous could take me hours. Honestly, Professor, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you.